All right, we started off strong and we hope to build that momentum. As Perry Ann said, you know, the innovation doesn't stop and it really is a partnership and I applaud all of you for coming here for a platform of communication. We talk about how innovation really moves forward only when the rails exist. So up here on stage, you, hear, you will be hearing from some of the most powerful and influential uh, payment and exchange rails. We do it on the data and infrastructure side and the media side, the information rails. Uh, but one would argue that the policy rails must also strongly align to this entire industry if it is to move forward. And so we come here at a time where the headlines are blaring, erosion of distrust. We're seeing day to day from an exchange perspective that people are taking money out, the trust is not there, there is capital flight. But then buffeted by more headlines of now the banking industry, traditional finance, and where do we find that safety haven? So as we talk about what happened in the decentralization space, and you have an OG here with Eric Voorhees, and you have some OGs here from the policy space, and now in the decentralized and exchanged crypto exchange space, let me start off with a question for our panel. As these headlines erupted, exploded, what did you see from a decentralization front that perhaps others did not see, but within the industry you really saw what kind of migration, what kind of activity post these headlines? Eric, I'll start with you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so we had a lot of headlines over this last year, and uh, most of them were horrible. This is probably like the worst year in crypto history. Um, I think observers made the mistake of assigning these headlines to cryptocurrency broadly when nearly every single disaster was a disaster of centralized intermediaries um, and really had nothing to do with the specific technologies that uh, are the reasons we're all here. So um, decentralized finance obviously works according to immutable code that anyone can see, open source, and it acts precisely according to that code. Um, Intermediaries run according to the squishy feelings and behaviors of humans. And so this last year, I think, was really an example of um, demonstrating the superiority of open, immutable code over um, you know, the, the rules and behaviors of uh, central intermediaries. You saw that flight into DeFi? Um, not as much as it should, I think, because a lot of people aren't making the proper distinction between where the problems were and where the solutions were. And they see the problems being broadly on crypto rather than with specific intermediaries and the solution being these open source immutable decentralized protocols. Kathy. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be with you and with this distinguished panel. Uh, with respect to decentralization, it really is uh, truly an interesting year, uh, as Eric said. I haven't been following this as long as he has, so I'm a little later to the game, but it's demonstrated by everyone in this room and everyone watching, the interest is growing. Um, why are we not seeing you know, a flight of funds to decentralization? There's a lot of what I would call swirl. It's a, you know, the, the uncertainty about exactly what is safe. You look at social media as the source of information for this industry, there are a lot of different voices out there. And we also have a lot of fraud in this space. Wherever there is value, wherever there is money, there are gonna be people looking to make money at the expense of others, uh, certainly illicitly and illegally. And so that I think is one of the challenges that those who are leading voices in the industry and, and advocates for the space can do a lot to help really clarify some of those things. And I think as we get best practices and as you have truly decentralized rails, people will see the value and understand that better. But I think part of it is a communication challenge and so much noise that is out there that is, is frankly confusing to average people. 
Jonathan, over at Kraken, what, what did you see in terms of immediate behavioral activity in the marketplace uh, from your perspective at Kraken? Yeah, so thank you. I think, you know, from a market integrity perspective um, at Kraken and other established markets, things worked well. The markets functioned as they're designed to do, um, both with centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges. Um, I do think from a policy perspective, you know, there's been a lot of confusion about crypto's contribution um, or impact here. And unfortunately, that's resulted in, uh, I think, a lot of knee-jerk reactions. Um, yes, there's been an enormous amount of volatility. Um, there's been vulnerabilities in the market. But that shouldn't drive a, a broad reaction. Um, we should sort of be deliberate about the policy reactions. I think, um, you know, in the near term, we've, signed, we've seen, at least in the U.S., a lot of activity in the states um, to complement some of the federal efforts. And so we're going to continue to support these policy efforts and hopefully educate stakeholders um, so that we have the right outcomes in terms of the regulation that we believe is needed for centralized exchange marketplaces. For Sean, over at DYDX, uh, what, what did you see? Yeah, well, you know, I just came to DYDX three months ago. So the preceding seven years, I was working in the United States Senate, right? And so a lot of the turmoil of 2022, I saw through that lens. And so immediately coming over, as a person who has a certain level of belief in decentralization and in the technology, I saw and tried to make the case to folks that, you know, while we're seeing these centralized entities, have issues, failures, collapses, we're actually seeing the protocols last, sustain, right? And I think we saw some capital flow into decentralized protocols, into the DeFi space, um, but that was mainly, I think, you know, building off of what Eric said earlier, I think a lot of cash, you know, flowed out of the system because there was that conflation of centralized intermediaries and, and the protocols themselves, but I think for folks who wanted to participate in the space, we did see a bit of that transition um, into DeFi. So it, it was, it, it was um, a defining moment to some degree the last year um, in showing that you know, this technology is not subject to the same whims of, uh, of people and their decision making. I would say that uh, there seems to be an evolution of conversation as well. Um, Eric, you and I spoke uh, a couple of years ago, and certainly the space seemed uh, a lot more, uh, I don't know if the word is avant-garde, but just, just moving forward um, and, and you know, with, with a focus on the technology and potentially less on the structure as it exists within government and, and society and, and, and such in terms of the policy rails. Fast forward to today, we really see, you know, teams with incredibly pedigreed folks like yourselves who come from the government side to participate on behalf of the industry uh, to face forward. That maturity is evolving. Where do you feel Eric, for you, because you've been in the space the longest, really. How do you see this ev evolution going? Have we reached peak conversation, or do we have a long ways to go? I guess I would say it's, it's unfortunate when, um, when projects which are trying to build actual solutions to problems uh, veer away from engineers who build those solutions toward basically trying to get um, Washington or state-based governments uh, from harming them. And you, you see this kind of perversion from these very interesting entrepreneurial startups, and as they get bigger, they start to ossify, and huge portions of their payroll um, go to compliance, right? And like the best example of this, of course, is the, the banking system itself. We're in like some banks, like 20 or 30 percent of the payroll is just, just in compliance. Like some of these big banks have literally thousands of people working in compliance or in regulatory affairs. Um, and you also notice that like the banking industry does not innovate anything. It's become completely ossified 
um, does not solve problems for people and has an absolutely horrible reputation and the whole thing is like burning down in front of us right now. I think these things are, these things are related. So the beauty of, of crypto is that you have people that are actually building um, this technology from an engineering perspective and thank God that they're not just sitting around asking permission to do so. They're just building it without permission. And sometimes they have to do that anonymously because they feel so threatened and so endangered by various government regulators, that they simply do not feel safe um, you know, being, being public about who they are. I think that's a, a travesty. I think that's un-American. And uh, I hope that that gets better with time, but I'm not super positive on that. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a view on the, the spectrum of the political reality that we live in today. There, on one hand, it is that innovation and entrepreneurship and pioneerism that have expanded our frontier, have expanded our horizon. And yet the stability of a framework of society, of a structure, allows us to engage with each other with trust. How have you, uh, Kathy, um, thought about that from your you know, experience uh, with obviously one of the biggest you know, government agencies and now having to you know, use that, those communication skills and understanding the landscape, how are you moving that forward over at Solidus Labs? No, I think it's, it's, I can build definitely off of what Eric just said because I spent my career seeing massive transformative events and, and disruptive events and thinking about how we need to still just build incrementally. I mean, change is hard for people. Building change, you, know, you, you have this, this whole regulatory structure that we've built upon. You've got all the incumbents embedded in it. And so, you know, you just keep pushing the rock up the hill and look for ways that you can make it at least somewhat better. But as Eric noted, we have so many things that have completely calcified and so many of those rules and requirements and compliance things that have all piled on top of each other. You have to stop and think about how effective any of it is. It really is something that requires fundamental uh, transformation, re-examination, thinking about why are we doing the things that we are doing and do they make any sense? That's the exciting thing about this industry. It really is asking those questions. You know, having technologists come at human problems and issues and really saying, look, there's a totally different way to think about this. And, and that's one of the challenges in talking to regulators too. You know, that's, that's where they're coming from. So I absolutely encourage those. It does take effort, as Eric noted, but, but engaging and explaining the problem you're trying to solve, sharing the use cases, it matters. And, and we are making progress. Uh, as much as we could all get pulled back on some of the things that are less positive out there today, we are making progress with people understanding and seeing the use cases, the, the things that can actually solve and move things forward, but changing the, you know, the current structure, the way people have built on it, it just takes, takes time. Jonathan, Kraken is a pioneer. You've, and, and because of that, you've faced numerous regulatory investigations. Um, the exchange started in 2011, okay? Seven years later, agencies came knocking. How would you describe right now as you've, you know, as, you know, Kraken has overcome a lot, a lot of these regulatory hurdles and as Eric said, has really kind of been that, that, that bottleneck uh, of, of energy and efficiency in, from, a, from an entrepreneurial uh, perspective. How would you describe the regulatory environment in the U.S. right now? And wh where do you think things stand from a policy perspective in the U.S.? Yeah, there's a lot of different components to policy in our space. Um, you know, Kraken's, as you said, you know, one of the oldest and largest of the digital asset markets. Uh, but uh, our business has broadened over the years. Um, we offer trading in over 200 assets, but also OTC trading and futures uh, where we're licensed. Um, we actually operate one of the world's uh, largest and most widely used uh, crypto index providers, CF Benchmarks, which is licensed and regulated in the UK. Um, we were proud to launch our NFT market last year, um, and we're soon to launch uh, our services under our special purpose depository institution charter uh, in the state of Wyoming. Um, there's a lot of different facets to our business and regulatory change and policy 
uh, is touching each of those. Um, so our policy team, um, which you know I was charged to establish uh, and build over the last 16 months, um, we're on the ground in London, Brussels, and Washington. And I think you know we see um, different jurisdictions at different stages of the development process. I think here in the US, um, we categorize things in four big buckets. This is oversimplifying, but if you think about policy in terms of market regulation, consum consumer protection is one, um, financial crime is another, banking prudential regulation is a third, and tax is a fourth. Um, I'd say on the financial crime and AML space and tax, there's you know, been a lot of positive progress, right, and constructive engagement, dialogue. Um, I think where um, we sense frustration is on market regulation, particularly with centralized exchanges. Uh, regulation of centralized marketplaces is, is not a new concept. Uh, I spent over 11 years working at um, some of the largest traditional uh, financial market and exchange groups. Um, and there's core components here that are, are very applicable to regulating centralized markets such as ours. Um, listing, disclosure, market integrity, custody, segregation, customer asset protection. These are all um, very common themes. Um, yet, I think what we've seen is um, the intent and desire to simply take this new technology and shoehorn it into traditional market rules and regulations and labels. Um, and there are just nuances with the technology um, that you know, would create a bad outcome there, right? And would really damage not just innovation, but I think competitiveness uh, here in the US. So there's a lot of good ideas on the table to legislate in this space, um, and we're really encouraging Congress and our policymakers to act and, and bring clarity. Can I, can I jump in real quick? I, I, think, I think Jonathan's a little too polite to, uh, to bring this up. But um, Kraken has been absolutely like one of the stalwarts of the industry. You guys have been around for a long time, done great work. You have not stolen billions of dollars of customer money. And I think it's, it's atrocious that, um, that FTX was like the darling of DC. And yet a company like Kraken that's been around actually doing good work for so long has faced all this regulatory scrutiny. Like there's something seriously wrong with that. And if the regulators were out to actually protect people, they probably would have been going after FTX for committing the greatest financial fraud in crypto history and maybe uh, not be so rude to, uh, to Kraken. So if anyone out there like, has anything to do with FTX or, or Kraken, maybe um, think a little on that. That is a very um, solid point. We are in the nation's capital and we are very clear that while we're talking about policy, politics, is very much the purview and the tailwind that drives a lot of these conversations. It is part of the language of uh, this country. Uh, it is part of the vernacular, um, which I think is also super unique. When we talk about the maturing of the space, I look at you and then I look at um, our, our very esteemed panelists who come from a, a very uh, uh, experienced background in policy and in government. And Rashan, you're a perfect example of, you know, this DYDX as a decentralized exchange is looking to somebody like you with your platform of expertise, with your network and your ability to, to navigate within the structure of Washington, D.C. to try to advocate for itself. How do you see your role, and, and certainly as a new participant in this space, what, what in your mind is going to be your, your value set here? Yeah, no, that, that's a great, great question. I think I see these different pieces as intricately tied together. Right? We have our policy that obviously our policymakers set on Capitol Hill. We have the regulations that the executives in force, and, and then we have this political system that kind of ties all these things together. I think, um, you know, hopefully I can work and, and be a voice for DYDX and DeFi and hopefully for part of crypto writ large to help connect all these things and help us see the places where we need to, to be active. I think there's a, there's a trite phrase in policy circles, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So I think 
you know, in order that we're not cut up to the specifications or cooked in the way that other people would like us to be served, we have to be deep within these conversations and making sure that we tell people what the merits or the risks are of decentralization, right? Which that's obviously the focus of this specific panel. You know, there are, there are pros and there are cons, you know, for some people. Self-custody is a great thing, but if you really don't wanna keep your keys, then there are solutions that are on a different place in the spectrum. So going into each of these different ideas that are unique to crypto and to decentralized um, solutions is important and making sure that we're bringing those solutions to the right parties. Eric, building trust, is that something that is achievable? <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, so, in finance, people have been trying to build trust using the reputation of uh, individual people and brands and policies, and that's how we get the traditional financial system. Um, that works okay, but history is rife with examples of that trust being violated everywhere from, you know, a, a small um, payday lender all the way up to the central banks of the world. Um, they destroy that trust periodically, and they're humans. Right? So hu humans are fallible creatures. We have finally, finally, an alternative way of building trust which does not re rely on the, the subjective whims of human fallibility. That is with open source code, essentially with mathematics. So if we can trust mathematics, we can build trusted finance using mathematics. This is what DeFi is all about. Uh, it's amazing that people who care about rules, right, like we're here in DC, um, DC is supposed to care about rules. The builders in DeFi are creating financial systems which enforce rules 100% of the time all over the world, purely as written in an open and objective way where there is no, no bias at all in its execution. DeFi is order in this way. DeFi is superior to law. And um, when we talk about building trust, like we actually can do it mathematically now. So that's a very special thing. This is something that will change the world and we can actually create a financial system that people can rely on 100% of the time because it's built, built on mathematics instead of people. So how do you bridge that and what Rashawn said, which is if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Do you think you're on the menu? Uh, I'm definitely on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> um, the appetizer, the entree, and the dessert. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what's not on the menu, uh, what's not on the menu is the decentralized platforms themselves, right? Like they operate um, out of the bounds of human perversion and coercion. Uh, Bitcoin being the greatest example of this. Uh, Bit Bitcoin, by all objective views, uh, essentially violates, you know, all financial regulation that the world has built up over the last couple decades. Why hasn't it been shut down? Because it can't be. Because it lives on a plane that is above, uh, above humanity. And this is what makes it objective, this is what makes it fair, this is what makes it superior, and this is what makes it virtuous. So, you know, here's a, it's the flip side. The flip side is, should we invite the regulators to the code level? If you're wanting to, you know, instead of demanding the technology to sit at the table, is there a way to invite the regulators to the open source, to the code level? Uh, that is fundamental. I, I mean, I completely agree with Eric, uh, Eric's assessment of things, and as does the audience, it sounds like. But you still have to deal with the human element of people actually understanding and engaging with it. And there are generational changes happening now too in terms of people's comfort level with technology. Uh, you, you saw it in the pandemic in spades. I'd rather look at a, a device than the person standing in front of me. So we're getting more and more comfortable with I, I think a lot more technology and more technologically savvy people. But look, Washington is one of those bastions where everyone's still wearing suits and it is definitely a much more traditional place. And the regulators are that way too. Again, 
regulation is built on all of that history and the notion that precedent uh, really could be looked at fundamentally and, and, and thinking about these things more broadly in terms of the effect and the impact, it is something that is a bit revolutionary, I suppose. The notion that, that regulation can change. Um, decentralization, we've had a lot of questions too with respect to, is it truly decentralized? Who's making money from it? When you're talking about finance, somebody's trying to make money. So how do we actually assess and understand that? And those are the things that regulators are grappling with. And you do have people in the agencies who are, who are trying to understand. And so getting that engagement around, again, understanding what the opportunity is, um, is, is going to take a little bit of time. But it's still uh, very much worth our time uh, as an industry. I mean, that's why all of us are sitting here today and, and still living uh, and working in Washington. And I note that we have the liberty and the freedom to have these really robust and candid conversations. Jonathan, you and I were reminiscing about Hong Kong and uh, for the past 10 years uh, as, a, as a foreign correspondent uh, leading out of Hong Kong, um, certainly aware of the dynamics uh, and certainly with China top down very categorically uh, banning crypto, and yet this innovation persists, exists from the ground level. Uh, I kind of uh, uh, compare crypto to water. It will always find a way. And in that way, Jonathan, where do you see us right now uh, as you evolve the business from, from uh, a crypto perspective, as the world really wants to engage, what is the opportunity right now for policymakers here to also engage and to champion the kind of innovation that is allowed to exist in a country like this? Yeah, I think, um, look, this conversation's not unique to Washington. Um, you see a lot of developed markets, emerging markets, grappling with this, right? Um, and in some sense, um, the, the technology is paramount here, right? I mean, having spent a lot of my career in traditional markets, you see um, things that are clunky, processes that are inefficient and costly. Um, and you see the real power of not just blockchain technology, but DeFi as a key driver um, to really improve the way our society functions and our financial markets function uh, and to improve access. So that's a powerful thing. Um, in terms of international engagement, these markets are more global than any other markets I've ever worked in. I think we heard um, the CFTC commissioners talking earlier about uh, regulation of global markets. And, um, one thing that concerns us is that as these conversations progress in Europe and Asia, here in the Americas, um, we'll end up with a patchwork of different regulatory frameworks. Um, and if we look back to the post-08 crisis reforms, um, there was a lot of work that was done, uh, but there were some clear international principles that guided those efforts. Um, and it didn't land uh, in a perfect harmonized fashion, uh, but it at least helped. Here, um, we're worried about what happens uh, if many different jurisdictions go in different directions. So uh, I think there's a real opportunity. You see the UK and Australia um, in the process of developing legislation. You see um, Japan, Switzerland having regulation in place, reviewing some of that. Um, so different jurisdictions are taking different approaches. Um, I know the international standard setters, not just in the market regulation space, but broadly, are also working towards uh, some more harmonized thinking, um, which we believe is greatly needed in this space. And just to jump on that too, it's really um, a lot of the starting point is around CFI, which, which makes sense. And regulators are looking at DeFi, but in the vein of trying to understand it, trying to understand that there are risks. And Rashan said there are pros and cons to the decisions that people make, and how how and where they want to store, uh, you know, their their money and and their investments. And so thinking about that and being, um, you know, thoughtful is is what a lot of the international regulators are doing, and together. And it is hard. Uh, we're not going to tear down the walls of, of nation states and note that there are actual jurisdictional lines here that are geographic. 
but that is a barrier to the continued expansion of decentralized finance, of crypto, of, of the rails that can really uh, transform the way we, we live and work just like the internet did in this next evolution. So there required, there's required coordination, there's required conversation, but there will be those jurisdictional lines. So trying to understand how best to do this, um, it, it, will, it will definitely need uh, um, that kind of coordination and engagement with, with those in the room. The innovation also uh, gets to move forward when all of the, the pollution of, of the, the cons of the technology and the participants who really pollute that space are removed. And that is hopefully the role of legislation and policy. But of course, that only exists if you can understand the technology that only exists if you are clear enough about the innovation that you can be so specific to, you know, excise that that uh, those participants. So, last question for for the panel, and, and 30 seconds for for each answer, if you could. Uh, and I wish this could go longer, but we are holding uh, to time. If there was one hardline legislation out there um, and or, or um, attitude out there that must go away in order for this innovation to move forward uh, with the, the greatest degree of independence, what would that be? And I'll start with you, Rashan, and move back in. Um, I think we need to make sure that we're um, making protocols permissionless and that builders can build. Um, I think there are secondary things that we can do to keep people safe on top of that, but if we're infringing upon um, speech and the ability for people to innovate, then we're going nowhere fast. Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, we're a marketplace. Our success, failure, um, is pegged to the success or failure of the innovators that bring uh, their projects to our marketplace. Um, I think the one thing that needs to go away is paralysis in terms of getting something done uh, that will provide clarity for centralized exchanges. Um, the EU has finalized their rules uh, and are moving on to the regulatory phase, and we are business planning as a business, um, and we want to get to a point where we can do that in the U.S. Uh, with clear legislation. Yeah, certainty is, is definitely at the top of, of desire, but I would, I would note the other side of that. Let's make sure as we look at market structure, we don't re-embed intermediaries as a required part of the ecosystem because we will completely miss out on the opportunity of decentralization. Um, let's remove this notion that the government should know everything about everyone as a fundamental principle. Let's, uh, let's maintain fidelity at least to the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution and permit free sovereign individuals to have um, privacy in their own lives. Uh, unless we want this to be China or Russia, let's permit privacy among people. Um, and that requires, I think, a substantial mentality change on the part of uh, regulators. And that requires listening and acknowledgement of other people's perspectives. And I applaud all of you for listening and doing exactly that. Thank you to our panelists today.